Hello and welcome to Shattered Lives, the Irish Daily Star and Irish Mirror's crime podcast. I'm Paul Healy. I'm back after a long break and I'm glad to see that Michael O'Toole is still here and happy and ready and willing to do another podcast with me. Our podcast is produced by the wonderful Andre Skintian. And while I was away, uh, Owen Murphy, our news editor, stepped in and did a, a great job. I, I listened to the pods. Uh, he is quite the professional and has, has done me uh, to shame, really, because uh, he certainly knows what he's doing uh, when it comes to broadcasting. And um, I, I thought the episodes were really good and um, educational and actually educate, uh, kept me a company when I was stuck in an airport uh, for six hours. Actually, I don't know what I was doing, uh, losing my mind, listening to Shattered Lives while on my holiday, but I did. And it was very, very good. So um, uh, great job, lads. So, Mick, how are you? Uh, I'm grand. Have you Welcome missed me? back. You're breaking up? Have you missed me? You're breaking up? <laughs> um, okay. No, Owen was great. But, no, brilliant. Uh, you know, brilliant, and plenty it's, it's of things. Great to happened. have you back. Plenty of things happened while I was away. I, I actually, now that I think about it, I, I actually want to just very briefly mention um, the 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 death of Jim Callie because that, I mean, I I know you just mentioned it on the pod, but I just want to uh, pay tribute to him as you know he he was a, a phenomenal person, uh, everybody's friend. The second you met him, um, you were his friend he invited you into your home no matter who you were had plenty of time for for everybody and fought tirelessly uh for rachel to get justice for his daughter and he suffered a lot of tragedy in his life uh, a great great man so just want to mention that i know he passed away um and there were plenty of tributes to him um yeah wonderful man yeah very much so and we, we did speak about him in one of the previous pods but it is that, that that's a lovely thing to say he was uh, because you would have been i would have known mr callally really since 2004 but obviously you, mm. you you came into the job later on so i think that's testament to the man that he didn't just go right i'm only going to talk to journalists who i've known since the start i think he would have spoken to anybody and i think he was really to protect Rachel's story and to protect her legacy and I, I think that is testament to the man so God bless him. Totally. Um, we want to talk, we want to start today's pod talking about Kerry, a very very dramatic story obviously uh, and uh, quite insane really when you break it down but uh, at the moment just where things currently are I'll speak about that first we as of recording this podcast there are two people currently still in custody they're being questioned by Gardaí um, in connection with this shocking find, 33 million euro worth of crystal meth discovered in a container in, in a shipping container in, in Cork Port last Friday. Um, I think we all took a step back when we heard crystal meth. I don't think anybody was expecting there to be a seizure of crystal meth, let alone on that kind of scale. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that, I'm sure, in a moment. But just in relation to these two men, they were in court yesterday. Um, and how this process basically works is when Gardaí are detaining people under uh, this Act, Section 50, uh, they need to regularly ask a a a judge, a district court judge, to extend the detention period if they want to continue to question suspects. And they have had to do that already, um, having these suspects detained up uh, past a certain hour on Sunday. And then they had them in court to detain them for a further 48 hours. So they've been in custody or uh, up until the court appearance yesterday, they had been in custody uh, for 118 hours being questioned. Now, during that time period, they uh, can take breaks and consult with their solicitor. So every time they take breaks, that that detention period is frozen. But one of them is a leading businessman. We can't name these individuals. There is a court order in terms of identifying them, but he is the, a, a, a businessman. And the other individual who is under arrest is a well-known criminal, known to Gardaí, um, and is the son of a former politician. So I think it's come as a shock to the people of Kerry and Cork, uh, this discovery of methamphetamine, but also that these two individuals are caught up, allegedly caught up in it, uh, particularly this businessman who is quite well known. Um, and yeah, I mean, just where do we step on this, Mick? Because we know it's all linked to Maurice O'Shea Salazar and to the Sinaloan cartel. Um, but I, I still think this caught everybody off guard on Friday. Yes. So last Friday, 
we got a, a small tip that one is there's, there's been one fella, not the businessman, but the, the criminal you were referring to. Mm. We've known for maybe a couple of weeks that this person had alleged links or links that were being investigated to Mex Mexican Morris. They called him Mexican Morris in, uh, it was Clarglin, wasn't it? Where he was, yes. he was living. So I went down there last year with Mick O'Neill and we got some some I great remember. stuff. And that was, it was really the first, and I'll have to, uh, our, our editor, Neil Leslie, uh, tweeted this. So not that I'm going to be sycophantic, but he's obviously always right. We did the, the great headline, El Chap of the Morning to you because it was, we got the first picture of Morris your man Mexican Morrissey was called it was just great to go down there because we were walking around effectively a, a working class housing estate that maybe I would have been brought up in and I was like oh yeah your man Morris I'm the Mexican yeah and suddenly this fella is up to his yin yangs in the world's biggest and most dangerous cartel and it's like you know, it, it's it's even probably too surreal for Breaking Bad. This young fellow who grew up here, who everybody knew as I say he went, he went to school and everything here and suddenly he, he's implicated not just as being a member, but helping to run this massive cartel that we only really read about in the movie. So that was quite surreal. So we did uh, get that, and it was great. I had a chap in the morning to you when we sort of highlighted him. But, uh, and it just goes to show you the nature of our job. And I always say this, Paul, sometimes we know what's going on. Sometimes you know 10% of what's going on. And obviously it's clear now that there has been a significant investigation by the Garda, Kerry Divisional Garda Drugs Unit down there. But, but I think maybe people in Doc B knew how big it was, but I, I just wonder how many people really knew how big this investigation and this operation down there was. Because, you know, because we heard about it. I think if you remember, Paul, I, I was talking about it on Friday. I heard that this fellow who's connected to Salazar had been arrested and that there'd been a drug seizure. Mm -hmm. So I'll be honest, I was, and I think you probably were, I... I I think I was expecting a couple hundred grand's worth of cocaine. That was sort of the vibes, I think, from the time. And yep. then suddenly, a oh, huge amount of, of drugs, 32. We thought it was 60 million at the start because you know, all yep. the thing was floating around. And then 32.8 million. And then it's crystal meth. And I was looking at my files. I remember there was a crystal meth factory found in Ireland in 2018. But I look at the Garda reports every year for drug seizures. And crystal meth doesn't really... Oh, fixture isn't really a fixture here. It's not really a thing. It's cocaine. Mm. The biggest drug in Ireland, I always say, is cannabis and then followed by heroin and cocaine. It's always cannabis by a country, mate. So uh, even crack cocaine is quite small. And, you know, uh, what's that other drug uh, that's big in America at the minute? It's it's really... Fentanyl, are you talking about? Fentanyl, yeah. Because I was at a, a, a meeting... Uh, Angie Willis, the commissioner for Dublin, was talking about this, and uh, Shane McCormick, who's the detective superintendent in the Garda National Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau, was speaking to Dublin city councillors, councillors, and he said, "We don't, we haven't found fentanyl in Ireland, fentanyl in Ireland in years, so it's not a thing." And I thought crystal meth, because of the, the small amount of seizures here, wasn't really a thing. So when you hear the thirty-two point eight million of crystal meth has been seized here, you go, "Whoa!" But obviously. The belief and suspicion is that this was destined for the Australian market. That, in other words, mm. the Sinaloa cartel with Mexican uh, Morris had effectively been using Ireland as a staging post for delivering crystal meth and God knows what other drugs around the world. Hey, that is just incredible, isn't it? I mean, it, it, the Sinaloa cartel are using County Kerry, uh, <laughs> Lord and County Kerry, uh, and elsewhere areas around Munster uh, as a as a base. Like it, as a as a, they have a and now now it seems um, that that Morris O'Shea had a cell operating here and that he has had people working with or working for him here and those individuals well the law is seems to be possibly catching up on them now but obviously there's been a sleeper cell for the Sinaloa cartel operating down in the south of this country which is insane. When you think it about sound, it, yeah, it sounds like a Brendan Gleeson crime movie, something like a guard, doesn't it? You don't know. I mean, I, I bet mm -hmm. you there's some fella or some woman sitting in a room in Hollywood or LA somewhere going, This is going to be great. And he's typing away at the whole thing. I'm in mm -hmm. the money. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you couldn't make it up. Maybe I'll make that my next book. I don't know. But anyway, look, oh, it is, can, it's completely bizarre. I can see the Netflix documentary already. But just in terms of Morris O'Shea, I mean, the history of him is is fascinating. Uh, and I must admit, I, I mean, I, it, like I'm quite new to his story, but I, I've been re reading up a bit on it. And I mean, obviously, you spent a bit of time down there and speaking to locals about him. Um, I think he is related tangentially to El Chapo uh, in relation to his mother. I think his mother 
is a sister of El Chapo, one of El Chapo's wives, I think is the connection. Yes, there's a distant uh, relationship there. And essentially what we know is uh, Morris's father was Irish from Calorglin and his wife or his mother is obviously Mexican and they were living abroad for quite some time and then they came back to Ireland. I think just from memory, I, I just remember speaking to people, I think he, he they came back to Ireland when Morris was about 12, 11 or 12, because he went to secondary school down there. I remember speaking to one fella who was in school with him. And here's the hilarious thing, right? When he was in secondary school, he used to tell people that he was involved in a cartel and they thought it was just teenage wow. bravado. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? But it turns out, allegedly, that it was true. And he did sort of, uh, the, way, the, 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 the vernacular is he, he acted the bollocks a few times, trying to act birdie big bollocks. And it was soon, you know, you don't mess around with carry heads, really, do you? So he soon softened his cough when he tried it on with a couple of lads. But yeah, I mean, he just used to go around boasting that he was involved in a cartel. So his father died. I think his father died. I think it was in a car accident. And then he did, he eventually left Ireland. He, um, if memory serves me, he went to live in Spain. And that's where the investigation really started to focus on. And essentially, and over the allegation is that he was running an offshoot of the uh, Sinaloa cartel, which is based in Mexico. He was running it. He was trying to set up operations in Chile. And it's the Chilean authorities that, just to remind people, they have e effectively started the prosecuting process against him. So he is a suspect for setting up a cartel offshoot in Chile, which is pretty serious. But they have named him and everything over there. So really, he's effectively charged over there. But he's not in the country. Oh, he's a wanted man. I mean, they don't know where he is where he is i think they maybe suspect where he is but they haven't found him i mean who knows maybe he's still down in Calorgan somewhere for all they know i doubt it at this stage but uh yeah can we just it is it is funny but it's serious to him Sam. does this are there implications for irish state security in this particularly by the if people are and with you know guards have always said this you know like look at the mv matthew for example you know, yep. uh, two point two tons of cocaine seized by the Army Ranger Wing of the the South Coast there last September. The belief would be that that was set for transit to Britain and Europe. Maybe some of it was for Ireland, but there always has been a belief that Ireland is effectively a transit hub for drugs because we're the first country from the South America that you reach in Europe, and we know that, for example, the naval service can only muster one ship at the minute at a time for patrols, and. We are there, even with my defence reporter hat on. There, there, if, in the last month, there has been an increase. The British media and even the Taoiseach of Radko was grilled about Irish security over in Munich last week. So it's there's a, a a real. I think there's a head of steam building up about Irish security, and a key part of Irish security is drugs interdiction. And I just wonder, and I've always thought this, and a lot of defence people think this, internationally is Ireland seen as a soft touch for, mm -hmm. for defence, but also for the security aspect of drug drawing, in other words, interdiction of drugs. It obviously must be. I mean, look, you need only look at the quantity of crystal meth that's been seized. I mean, so the, clearly th this cartel had enough confidence that they could hold their drugs here as a base before moving it on to ultimately Australia. And it may it begs the question, how long have they been doing this? How much has got through? You know? Yeah, I, I mean, do you, uh, right. You know, let's think about this. Is it likely that this is the first shipment? I don't think so. No, definitely not. No. So... It's the it's the whole thing about, you know, usually depends who you talk to. Garda sources would say that they get about 40% of all drugs mm -hmm. coming in. Customs officials sources would say it's about 10%, but it's clearly in the minority. So most mm -hmm. of the drugs that come through Ireland do not get intercepted by authorities. Mm -hmm. But how much of these drugs, we will never know. It's like, you know, Donald Rumsfeld and his known knowns and unknown unknowns and all that stuff. Because they're not caught, we simply don't know how many drugs are being, in, are being shipped through Irish waters or through Irish ports for onward dissemination around Europe. If that if Ireland gets a rep for being an easy touch for drugs, then I think we have a problem. Massively so. And I mean, it, we'll have to be slightly careful here. There are two individuals under arrest at the moment. And at the moment, they are, you know, only being questioned. There, there has been nobody charged. But by the looks of the way the investigation is going on, we know that they searched a commercial premises in the uh, greater Kerry area, uh, we know that this businessman is being questioned. Um, there seems to be a suspicion that the drugs uh, th that they were being based 
possibly within a commercial premises um and 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 that 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 this was operating as a front for this Sinaloa cartel. I mean, that is massively concerning. That somebody who, um, that 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 a business that is openly uh, well known and in the public domain uh, may possibly be being used as a base by by this cartel. Yes, and the other point is because I was thinking maybe, you know, it came into the port. It stayed in the port for a couple of days and then it, in the container and then it was going to be moved on. But there is this suspicion that it was, I don't know, treated or worked on at this business premises. So the other thing is, this business premise, we know where it is, we can't say, but it's a long way from Cork. You know what I mean? It's not yeah. next door. It's a yeah. good distance. It's What would it be? Two hours maybe? Yeah. So, I mean, how many people then were involved, you yeah. know? knowingly or unknowingly in the transport of crystal meth. I mean, it sounds like Breaking Bad, doesn't it? It, it, sounds, it sounds like, uh, it makes me think of Gustavo Fring and the uh, Las Poyas Hermanos, uh, the, the, the chicken business and, and using it as a front and all of that. But anyway. There is one concerning issue. And I, I, I don't know where they were seized, but, but two firearms were seized as part yes. of this investigation. Mm-hmm. The concerning issue that hasn't really been raised Okay, so the, if the cartel are here and they were used in Ireland, you know, as a logistics base, what's to stop the cartel getting involved here? Mm. What, in other words, having bodies on the streets? Now, I'm not mm. going to say it's like Mexico, but if anybody has been looking at the Mexican drugs war, there have been tens of thousands of people killed there. I'm not, I'm not saying it's going to happen here. I'm just saying, just say the cartel decide to become active in Ireland. Mm. that's worrying that's really worrying because they will bring things up another level now look I don't know I'm only it's, I'm only sort of worrying about this but you know what I mean just say they, they decide to get more active here then that's a serious problem yeah, and I don't know, maybe there's a, is there a potential gap in the market with the Kinnahans out of the picture? Perhaps uh, certain groups are coming in and taking advantage of that. Now we're purely speculating, but, you know. Well, well look, it, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. It happened after Gilligan. When mm. Gilligan was done in 1986 and he was charged, but later acquitted with the murder of Veronica Gearn, although he was convicted of drugs importation. Yeah. You know, we had people like the Westies and, you know, various groups coming to the fore. So nature does abhor a vacuum and people do do move to fill that vacuum. So look, if it's it's money, if it's a place to make money, so there's two things, Ireland as a, a an aircraft carrier really for drugs or a logistics hose for drugs. But what if they get involved here as well if they see the, the vacuum? So it's one to watch anyway. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it seems the Garda investigation is meticulous uh, and, and the judge uh, actually noted that yesterday and it seems to be going as quickly as it can. So, I mean, by the time this podcast comes out, we may have a development. These two individuals can be detained up until I think about half 10 on Friday. And then they either need to be charged with an offence or released without charge. So that's where we are currently. And and just just one point on this. Um, so people don't really realise the arrest is effectively the end of the investigation. Mm-hmm. So in other words, the guards have to have all their ducks in a row before they put... They, they get the arrest because that is, we're putting the allegations to you. And this is why it's taken so long because I would anticipate there's they have a shared load of evidence, including probably surveillance footage and most definitely CCTV and everything. So that's why it takes so long because everything has to be put to the prisoners. Mm. So, and that's because it's, it's it, it, you know, and there have been some cases where the Section 50 has gone the full week, but it's more, more usually three or four days that they're kept for. So it looks... Unless something happens, it looks as if it is going to be the full seven mm. days. And that's not overly common. And that is an indication to me that they have an awful lot of evidence to put to these people. Mm-hmm. And look, we're not privy to all of that. But I mean, you could surmise that obviously when they learned of the existence of Maurice O'Shea Salazar and the investigation into him abroad, um, they obviously reached out to the authorities and have been working in tandem with them. And there has been a well-broadcast EncroChat hack um, where a lot of information about these individuals has come out and certain names have come up. And I understand that one of the names was actually connected back to an Irish person who I think is now one of the arrested individuals. Oh. They suspect one of the arrested individuals. So is there a link then to the EncroChat hack that ultimately 
you know, gave them the intelligence to then go and move and investigate and uh, monitor these people. You make a very good point, Paul. And and you know that this is always said that why aren't Garda using EncroChat? I think they are using EncroChat and we've spoken about this before. I think they're just doing it in a slightly different way from Britain. And I think one of the reasons is our constitution and the, the very good thing, in my opinion, that, you know, barristers and solicitors here fight ferociously for rights and, you know, they question everything. And, you know, so what I'm getting at basically, if the guards used EncroChat as evidence, some fantastic barrister like Brendan Gren could go into court and say, Judge, I want this evidence struck out. So I think the guards are playing a long game and they're using it as intelligence. Yeah. yeah. Not that they don't have to use it in courts. It's just, well, we have, they call it confidential information and they don't have mm-hmm. to go into it. They can, you know, claim privilege in this mm-hmm. special and stuff. So I think that's what they're doing. So for me, uh, you know, it, it's unthinkable that the guards do not have intelligence from EncroChat because every country in the world got data dump with EncroChat. They're just using it differently. Well, yeah, I mean, you don't have to go very far to, to, to look at the details of this EncroChat hack and actually see what I'm referring to and the code names that have come up. Um, it would be incredible if Gardaí have not used that to their advantage and, and for their intelligence. So I'm sure they have. You know. And look look at all the seizures we've had. You know, I'm sure that, that this EncroChat has opened so many doors. Maybe the guards have just been a wee bit smarter because there, there are, it's the thing called Operation Venetic in England by the National Crime Agency. And there have been an awful lot of legal challenges to that. So maybe they're a wee bit smarter over here. Perhaps. Um, I, I want to, because should we move topics as we yeah. talk about Morris O'Shea all day, but um, and, and I'm sure we'll be talking about him again next week. Um. I just want to briefly mention uh, We Feel Prison and uh, that is because I had a story um, yesterday uh, in relation to uh, TikTok videos that have been put up so people know of the social media platform TikTok. If you don't, uh, don't download it. Don't do it to yourself. It's pretty awful. But uh, these videos have appeared on TikTok uh, apparently showing a, a rather large stash of what appears to be drugs and uh, booze. Um alcohol smuggled into Wheatfield prison and quite brazen social media posts uh, that say land packs stash and fuck the screws and catches at Wheatfield. And uh, as I say, quite brazen, not exactly trying to hide it in any way. Um, uh, sources have told me the videos appear to be legit. They did. It does appear to be a cell in uh, at least an Irish prison anyway, but you know, it claims to be Wheatfield prison. Um, off the back of uh, speaking to the Irish Prison Service about this, I've discovered that there is an investigation into this and that the prison's operational support group um, is investigating that. So the operational support group is it basically carries out, uh, the, the, that is the, the independent, well, they, it's a part of a wing of the Irish Prison Service and they specifically go to investigate um, wh- how, how contraband is being brought into the prison. So I understand that they're looking at those videos looking at the timing of them um, I'm told, you know, look, I mean, those videos went up when I did the story, they went up uh, 24 hours beforehand. Um, There is a suspicion uh, that possibly prisoners are not as stupid as we think they are. Although we have seen it in the past that they put up videos whilst being in prison. Um, But the suspicion possibly is that individuals are doing these videos. They are then being released they serve their time or whatever, and they then put the videos up after the fact, going, look at what we managed to get in. Um, but nonetheless, it's still serious. It shows that stuff is getting in and at a, a, a pretty high level uh, into Irish prisons. Um, we feel prison, I'm told, there is a particular concern about uh, that a huge uh, amount of drugs has been seized in Weefield Prison, discovered in Weefield Prison over the past two years. I believe last year, over a million euro worth of drugs was believed to have been thrown over the wall at Weefield Prison. So they do have a serious uh, issue there, although the Irish Prison Service will tell you that they have implemented measures and a new drug strategy since November of last year uh, to tackle this, uh, including new body scanners uh, for prison staff, prisoners, any visitors that go into prisons um, now go through this new scanner system. So they are cracking down on it, they say. And do you think... It, 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 this isn't an isolated case. How many videos have we seen of people singing and everything mm. behind bars? So is it stupidity or are they being brazen? 
I, I well, this this is the thing. I, I, I like I've, I've being told now, being advised that look, yes, it's more than likely that they're putting the videos up after they get out because there's no consequences for them. Uh, so they're not stupid enough to post them when they're in there. Although, as you say, we have seen examples of that before. But um, uh, they they think the majority of the cases they're they're not stupid enough to post it until they get out. Uh, but it's it's still brazen, no matter what way you look at it, because it is bragging. Look at the stuff we've managed to get in. But do you remember that guy? who was done for murder there a few weeks ago. And you remember when he was on remand, he did an interview, a full interview with a mm. British YouTuber. And he, he literally got done for that murder of that fella out in Crookslings in Tala a few weeks ago. Did you, but you know what I mean? I mean, and he, we, we, if, you know, we were able to establish who he was within two minutes of watching the video. So, mm. you know, he wasn't released. He did that behind bars with a phone. You know, Pat O'Connell in the Sunday World has done myriad stories about lads doing serious sentences who mm. they're saying it. Remember the guy who was being doing the raps and stuff? Maybe you were away, actually. You know what I mean? So he's not out. So I know what you're saying about some are doing it, you know, sort of post-dated whenever they get released. But it's clear that there are people who are videoing and sending messages out while they're in prison and it goes live while they're in prison. So I just wonder, is it that they don't have any fears of... They'll probably get a P19 and they might lose two weeks for remission or whatever. So in other words, do they give a crap? Yeah, I mean, I suppose if you're serving a long sentence, yeah, would you care? I mean, and uh, you take the risk to get a phone in and you see, I mean, even in these videos, the size of the phones, I mean, teeny tiny little things that they shove up God knows where uh, to get them in. They, they're they desperate enough to have them. Yeah. And I mean, in prison, you get a lot. Uh, these days, you get a lot. I mean, you get a TV, you get Netflix, uh, you get plenty of entertainment. Yeah, it's not enough for them. They need to have TikTok. They need to have social media. Um, and and we, we, we've seen time and again, it won't be the last time we see these videos, sadly. But when it comes to, 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 to drugs, um, there is a serious concern there. And, and it, uh, look, I'm, I'm being careful with what I'm saying because there are ongoing investigations. But there, there is a serious concern about the possibility that of, 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 of corrupt uh, staff members uh, smuggling drugs in and there is an ongoing investigation into uh into that alleged activity and to how that's happening and into particular individuals it's very sensitive at this time um only last week a prison officer was arrested there was quite a lot of shock over that that officer is based in a dublin jail uh is now i i believe suspended um but the suspicion was uh, that they were smuggling the drugs in on their uniform through the collar. So the collar here, they had it stitched tablets, uh, hidden, stitched into the collar of their uniform. Um, so that's quite sophisticated. Um, and and I, sadly, the suspicion is that there may be other individuals who are doing the same. I did. A, do you remember? I, I, I can't remember. What, I think, were you here? I did a story about a prison officer who was arrested over a drugs bust outside the prison. Do you, do, yeah, do you remember I that? recall. I recall that. Yeah. Yes, and, yeah. and that was only a couple of months ago. I think it was around Christmas, and that officer has also been suspended. So they obviously could could done it at heart, but that was it wasn't the prison service thing. It was you know it was external to the prison. Yes, and that prison officer was one of I think it was three or four people who were arrested. It was a significant enough seizure. So look, I suppose it does happen. Yeah, and uh, it, you know it's important for us not to shy away from it. There's plenty of good people in the prison service, all doing a good job day in, day out. But they, sadly, you know, in in all professions, people can be corrupted. And 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 what I have been told, you know, in in relation to prisons, um, a tremendous amount of, of stress. I'm not I'm not trying to make any excuses for anybody here, but you you know you're dealing with hardened criminals. And oftentimes people are pressurized to do things uh, by these individuals and they get caught into a situation and before they know it. But but also I'd say, I think I'd be pretty confident that most prison officers share the same attitude about allegedly rogue or rogue prison officers that Gardy have about bad Gardy. So oh, other, yeah. how many times have you and I done stories about bad Gardy? Now, we're not, I never talk about, I never mention Garda sources ever, but... It's safe to say that every time we do a story about bad Gardy, there is, and we and we do more than any other, as you know, right? Mm -hmm. There is zero sympathy from our other guards. In fact, they're all delighted that they're they're done. Yeah, it's exactly the same. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, in the prison service, there are good men and women working there who are embarrassed and ashamed that this is going on. And I think in particular, there was a bit of shock over the arrest of the individual the, the previous week. Um, a lot of shock about that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they do feel it gives everybody a bad name. Um, I, I know that um, there is an ongoing investigation into this, uh, into how many individuals are possibly involved in this. So uh, there is a belief and a suspicion that it that there are more than one individual involved in a sophisticated network of possibly bringing drugs into prisons. Um, and they're looking at the methods at the moment as to how they're doing that. So look, I mean, I don't want to compromise anything. Obviously, you know, if you were going to investigate this, you have to surveil people. And I'm sure that that's going on. Um, so yeah, I'm advised that's an ongoing investigation and that, you know, the prison service are taking it extremely seriously. Okay, so we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens there. And then speaking of uh, prison. I think it was last Thursday, Freddie Humps, he's a 43-year-old and he appeared in court in front of Judge Andrew Cody where he is facing three charges. Two are of threats to kill a named prison officer and then another charge of assault causing harm on a named prison officer. Now, the court heard that he had nothing to say when the charges were put to him. Uh, he has been remanded. He's obviously in custody. He has been remanded on, on his own bail of 100 euro. Now, there's a, he's back on the 28th of February, early in the morning, I think at about a quarter past 10, for the book of evidence. Now, the book of evidence is significant because that means it's going to go in front of a judge and jury. So we're very limited as to what we can say. But we just wanted to mark the fact that he has been charged with these offences. Now, they're, they're, they're serious enough. Uh, assault causing harm can get you up to five years in prison if convicted. Long way to go. He's only been charged. And threats to kill bring a maximum sentence of 10 years. But it is sub judice, but I just wanted to, to mark the fact that uh, Freddie Thompson has appeared in court. Yeah, I, I think we can say some things. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but well, I, I think we can refer to we can certainly refer to the fact that he was brought there. Uh, there are pictures of him uh, being brought there by the prison service, and it's the first time that he has been seen um, out in a public uh, setting in quite some time. Yes, I think we can say that. But you. But, uh, <laughs> Shutter, you know, the sh we, shutters always come down. But look, mm. I, I do know, for example, that one paper, and look, every news, every paper has its own legal advice. One paper he quoted comments that he made outside the court. And we don't do that. We just go straight down the line. So he did make some comments in the court. Basically, he asked the judge, the judge was going to remand it for four weeks, I think. And he goes, judge, it's been going on a while. I'd like it for two weeks. And then yeah. he's, and the judge said, yeah, two weeks. And he goes, is that two weeks? Yeah, thank you, judge. So uh, other people can do what they want, but I, I, I just said what he said in court. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then also we're being cautious about this one as well because it is still before the courts, mm -hmm. but a um, Department of Justice uh, figure, uh, former Department of Justice figure, um, has pleaded guilty in, in relation to child abuse material, am I right? Yes, yeah, so this is Niall Colgan. He was a, a former press officer in the Department of Justice. Did you ever have any dealings with him? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I didn't know him personally, but like mm. anybody dealing with the Department of Justice, yes, you would have dealt with Niall because, uh, you know, he, he was a senior uh, mm. uh, press uh, person there. Uh, so I would have dealt with him kind of more so through email, probably would have rang him maybe once once or yeah. twice. Um, but I know it certainly came as a shock, uh, his, his arrest, and now he has pleaded guilty uh, to, to these rather disturbing charges. Yes, and I just, I just, I just go through them what they are. What they are. So he pleaded uh, guilty to possessing child abuse material last week at the Dublin Circuit Criminal Court, uh, court in front of Judge Martin Nolan. So he has an address at Muckross Park in Perrystown in Dublin 12, and he pleaded guilty to uh, one count, which is possessing child abuse material in the form of two videos and two images. So his barrister was Ronan Kennedy, senior counsel, who has asked the judge for a period of time to allow for preparation of report for sentencing. So the sentencing date is the 7th of May. Now, we don't know the facts because no facts have been given in court because he was charged. Uh, and all we know is that he was charged and he had pleaded guilty. But at the sentencing uh, hearing on the 7th of May, the full facts will be heard. So it's a uh, Garda Alan Young, Detective Garda Alan Young from Tala. He's the prosecuting Garda. So what will happen is he'll go into the witness box and he'll give the facts of what happened. We do know 
that he was that he admitted possessing the child abuse material at his home on the 1st of February 2022, so just over two years ago. So um, it's up to the judge. Uh, judge Nolan will sentence him, but for at the circuit court level, which is what Martin Nolan level is, possessing of child abuse material legally known as child pornography, the maximum at circuit court level is a fine of €6,350 and five years in prison. Five years in prison, yeah. But it's at the judge's discretion as to how... Uh severe he he wants to make that sentence and certainly um you know if you're going by precedent um first time offenders generally speaking are are, are not typically uh sentenced to jail but it is entirely up to judge martin nolan but uh, we we've seen the precedent before when it comes to a first time offense and he has also pleaded guilty to the offense uh, but we'll see what happens there and and look yes and you know speaking normally as part of the mitigation the plea and an early plea of guilt is mitigation. But look, it's well, 7th of May, so it's just over a few months away. So we'll see We'll see what happens then. But I just wanted to mark it because, look, you know, his press officer in the Department of Justice. So we would have had, I would have had limited dealings with him myself. I think like you, I may have spoken to him a few times on the phone and it would have been largely by email. Look, we're journalists. He's a press officer. He answers questions or he answers questions. Mm. I, I think it's, it's it's interesting that we're mentioning that and also we've just been talking about you know corrupt guardian and corrupt prison officers there's often uh, a narrative out there on social media that oh we, we we steer away from that and we work for the government and we we run away from stories like this certainly not uh, we're happy to talk about them and highlight them um, criminality happens in all aspects of society and we don't run away from it so. guards to reiterate this point I think it's fair to say guards are delighted when we do stories about bad guards or allegedly bad guards. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can't say where we get our information from, but, you know, I, I don't think guards are overly unhappy for news stories appearing about guards being arrested or guards being sacked or guards being jailed. It just happens and they just go, they have no sympathy for them. It's not in this, when it, you know, when they cross the line or they allegedly cross the line, all bets are off. Exactly. Exactly. So we're we're not uh, we're not a wing of the government for anyone who thinks we are. Certainly not. Um, well, I am. We, I'm a secret one. A secret one. Yeah. Um, oh, it's great to be back. Um, thanks to everyone uh, for continuing to listen to the podcast. Um, and uh, yeah, we we hope to see you maybe sometime next week. Yeah, I'm 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 away on a secret mission next week. So. Uh, oh yes. I'm away for a week. Um, on a job, really looking forward to it. But I can't really go into it. But I'll talk about it when I come back. But it's a, it's a biggie and it's a goodie. So we'll see what happens next week. This this is part of your your secret role with the government. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> building <laughs> is it building building Buildenberg or whatever. The the Buildenberg. Mm. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. See, I I pretend not to know how to say it. Just you know, to add to the authenticity of being a spy. Yeah, sadly, someone is actually going to take you at face value there and believe you. So um, yeah. Anyway, uh, well, while you're away, we'll see whether we can do a podcast or not. Um, but hopefully we, we will uh, talk to you in the coming days. And no doubt there'll be another development in Kerry. So thanks, everyone, for listening. And um, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. <laughs>